Okay. So like I said, today we're probably going to finish this more or less. We might be a couple slides short. Okay. So where we left off, we were talking about Amazon's value chain, right? So the fundamental map for how it works, they have some set of publishers over here. Here's Amazon in the middle, right? And here's customers. Okay, so over here, we're just gonna mark publishers, over here, site visitors, and here in the middle is Amazon. Okay, now the basic business model Amazon has a couple things, right? They have, uh, number one, processing the order, right? Taking the order. And number two, fulfilling orders. Those are two different things, right? So this process, this is the one that customers are directly interfacing with, right? Customers show up to the website, they enter in their order, Amazon takes it. Okay, that's what the customers see. Everything else is behind the scenes at Amazon. So Amazon's order fulfillment, that's a separate system, right? It contacts different publishers, potentially different wholesalers, tries to find out where it can get the book, if there are multiple places it can get the book, where it can get it for cheapest, how long it's going to take, stuff like that, okay? Also, early on for Amazon, Amazon didn't have its own fleet of delivery trucks, did it, right? It had some other kind of uh, operation. So it also had to branch off with these guys, shippers, right? So whoever they were shipping with, you know, guys like uh, UPS primarily, but I'm sure, you know, FedEx was probably an option, or, you know, USPS if you needed it, and we'll say, you know, here may be uh, local services, whatever they might be, okay? I don't know all the details of who Amazon shipped with back in the day. Okay, so this is their basic value chain kind of setup, right? Customers come in, they place an order, Amazon passes along that order to the publishers to try to find the stuff, passes along the information to the shipping, Amazon wraps it, bundles it, whatever else, they deliver the stuff to the customers, okay? So, if you insert a recommender system into this model, what part does that affect? What part does it defect directly? Does it directly affect the publishers? So Amazon has a recommender system. Is that going to necessarily immediately affect all the publishers? No, not really. They're still going to be doing publishing, right? And Amazon's still going to order books from them. It's not a direct impact. What about the shippers? No, not directly. But it's definitely going to affect this part, right? The taking orders. So instead of customers going on and there's like nothing there, there's just a website and Amazon has, you know, old system, old, basically a catalog, right? The Amazon says on their website, search their catalog listing of a million titles. That's the old one, new RS, recommender system. Now that's one more feature. So they have to include a spot for it on a web page. They have to set up a separate system that's running at scale and they know that scale is getting bigger all the time, okay? So that's fundamentally what's changing in the new world. In one second, I'm gonna, okay. New recommender system uh, at scale separate, okay? So it's its whole thing. Yeah, I saw a hand up. Inputs are books, outputs are still books. Right, so the inputs that are coming into the system, fundamentally the physical thing that Amazon is getting from the publishers, that's books. What they're sending out is books. 2019? Well, I mean, they have a wide variety of merchandise, right? But, but yeah, yeah. right, well, Amazon isn't a, isn't a manufacturer, right? So all they're doing, they're buying stuff from other people, right? Either they're buying it from retailers and reselling it, or they have vendors showing up to their site to sell through Amazon. But either way, Amazon is just basically a middleman. Okay. Anyway, so it's going to affect that part of the business process, right? That's the direct effects. But indirectly, what's it going to do? More business, right? That's, that's the assumption is having this recommender system in place is going to mean more business. Customers are going to come back. It's going to help Amazon keep growing. Uh, could affect individual, right, individual publishers and shippers. Or, 
right? They're basically, they're going to have to be prepared to do more business with Amazon, fundamentally. That's how the recommender system is going to affect them. Now, you might set up a situation where publishers see, hey, wow, this recommender system is really working well, and maybe the publishers start lobbying to say, well, we want to pay you some extra to have our titles preferentially listed in the recommender system, right? Don't think they do that, but it's certainly an option that I imagine was discussed at some point, right? A lot of these operations like Google, for example, Google keeps its search results pure, like site owners can't pay Google extra money to just have their site listed higher in the search rankings, but advertisers can pay more. So what you might have is publishers might be willing to pay more for advertising to show that their titles are listed with any of the results in the recommender system, right? So you'd have some kind of sponsored results as well. I'll mention that. Also, potential sponsoring of recommendations and associated ads. Okay, so the point of all this is not to memorize the specific changes for Amazon, but it's just to recognize that you implement the system, right, something new, it's going to impact the system, right? Recommender system, immediately it's going to impact how customers interact with Amazon, and then it's going to have cascading effects, indirect effects on other systems, and possible, possibly generate additional sources of revenue that, you know, wouldn't have been possible without it. Okay? Yes. Cascade effect, one thing rolls over to another. Yeah. Okay, not a technical term, though. Okay, so this is, you know, basically the stuff that we could have uh, talked about here. Adding steps, removing steps, changing values of steps. Things, different things are happening in the value chain at that point. And secondary functions, they're going to need a new IT system to manage this big, large-scale recommender system. HR, they might have to hire more specialized database people, right? Amazon of 1994 didn't really need strong database people, right? They just needed people to take orders. When you build up a recommender system, you need to have some smart guys devising algorithms for how this recommender system is going to work and be effective. And business partnerships, it's going to change that, like I talked about. You know, you're, uh, if the recommender system works well, you get more customers coming in, buying more books, that's going to mean more scale. It's going to change your business partnerships. Also going to change, you know, the possibility for things like advertising. Okay? All that stuff could change. Now, next, cop next concept, business intelligence. So, business intelligence is a very broad, broad, broad concept, and one that gets uh, tossed around a lot lately. Uh, basically... It just means analyzing data. Businesses get a lot of data. Business intelligence is essentially looking at that data and making some kind of sense of it. So internal data, right? Things like employee performance, item sales. You want to know what items are doing well, what items are doing not so well. You may take action with that, try to prop up some ones that aren't doing as well, or try to unload them quick and not order anymore, whatever. Same thing with employees, right? If you have employees that are very good, you might want to reward them. If you have employees that are doing not so well, well, you know, you've got to do something about that, okay? Possibly training, possibly firing, I don't know. Uh, and then there's external things, right? So supply chain performance. How are your shippers doing? Are they getting stuff on time? Maybe your order fulfillment team is getting all the packages out of the warehouse on time, but the shipping company you're contracting with is dropping the ball a lot. So you need to do something about that. Okay? So all that kind of stuff. Now, Amazon's recommender system is a type of business intelligence, right? It's going to take this raw business data. People who bought this also bought that and it's going to be applied to make better decisions. Now, normally, business intelligence is kept internal, right? It's considered an asset. It's something that your business has and it makes you special and you don't want to share with the rest of the world. However, Amazon is a little different, right? Basically, uh, Amazon shared this information with customers. Now, a lot of times what you'll see, uh, for example, in the retail world, uh, a lot of retail operations are, in a sense, kind of designed to fuck over the customer. Uh, so what they'll do in a grocery store, for example, they won't put everything that people want right by the door where it would be easiest to get to, right? That would be very convenient for customers. Like the, the store would look at their uh, sales and say, wow, we're selling a, a lot of beer and we're selling a lot of, uh, I don't know, breakfast cereal and coffee. And that's the stuff they put right by the door so customers can just go into the store, take two minutes, go right out. 
Stores aren't set up like that, right? Grocery stores, supermarkets, they're set up so people kind of have to wander around and look for stuff and try to find stuff. They're designed to kind of suck you in like a casino. Anybody been in a casino? I know you're young, but yeah, casinos are definitely uh, designed to be kind of uh, confusing and disorienting, right? And they have this kind of otherworldly quality, like you never know if it's three in the morning or two in the afternoon. Kind of always feels the same regardless. It's designed to just keep you in there for a while under the logic that the longer you stay in, the more money on average they're going to suck out of you. Kind of the same way with supermarkets. They want to bring you in, make you kind of hypnotized and, you know, buy stuff. Okay? So that's it. That's basically two ways they could use that information. Supermarkets say, no, well, we know what people want to buy. We're going to put that all those things that people want to buy in different corners of the store. So everybody who goes in has to go through the whole store to find it. Yeah. Now, that system worked before the Internet. If all the retailers are passively colluding, right, passively working together to make that the standard thing, then customers don't have a lot of choice. Customers are still going to go to a supermarket. If every supermarket is designed like that, what, are customers going to stop going to supermarkets? No, right? But Amazon, Amazon kind of blew up that model by sharing the information with customers. Customers no longer had to scour through the entire website and look at 90 things to find the one thing they wanted. Instead, the one thing they wanted was right there. Okay, wonderful thing. Okay. So if you're wondering, you know, one of the reasons why retail is uh, cratering so quickly compared to uh, online selling, that's one of the reasons why is... Uh, physical retailers were generally designed to make shopping a somewhat difficult experience. Anyway, so recommended design, uh, we can talk a little bit. What's fundamentally, what's the input? You get purchase data and possibly web browsing data, right? It's not perfect correlation, but we know somebody who looks at a product is at least a little bit more interested than somebody who never looks at the product. So if you don't have purchase data for something, like something, some brand new item, you might include uh, web browsing data, like customers who bought this also looked at this other thing. And the output is basically going to be some kind of set of related items, right? People who bought this also bought these. And however many items you get, right, you have some ranked correspondence. So, for example, we go to Amazon. We can see this. Somebody give, what's a, what's a product? What's a safe for work product? Hydroflex? Is that a thing? What is that, like drugs or something? Oh, Hydroflask. I'm going to score some Hydroflask, man. All right. Okay, we'll look at the Brita one. Okay, so let's see. People who bought this, these are sponsored ones. Again, like I said, here the sponsors have an opportunity to make money off of these recommendations. And here's the uh, more sponsored. Wow, they're just packing that shit, huh? Do you even see any non-sponsored ones? Ah, here we go. Customers who viewed this item also viewed that, right? So it's not ones who bought this also bought, but customers who looked at also looked at this. And here we see there's uh, seven pages. So we're going to say seven times six, probably about 42, give or take, might be a little less, 40 possible related items. Okay, so that's their input. The input is, you know, all their data about people who looked at this page also looked at these other products. And the output from this one system is this set of, you know, ranked items. And clearly Amazon's going to show us the best bets on the first page, right? So if we scroll through them a little bit, it'd be a little less likely. Now, one of the neat things, you can actually see this kind of dynamically. So for example, uh, if I go, I'm just gonna go back to Amazon again. Um, so the kids are reading Harry Potter now, and they also like Legos, right? So if I look up uh, Harry Potter, what was the uh, Deathly Hallows, right? If we're reading that, okay? We have the book, we have the video, well, we don't have the video, I mean, but it's here, right? So if I look at some of this, okay, I've looked at a video, and I'm going to see some stuff, and then I'm going to look at, uh, I don't know, let's, oh, the book is all just one volume, though. Okay, then I'm probably getting the book, so let's look at the book. There we go. Oh, yeah, I might, ooh, 24 bucks, shit, she's rich. Okay, so I start looking at this, right, and I'm going to see, okay, a lot of Harry Potter stuff, some related kids stuff, right? If I scroll through a little bit, uh, what's that? Some kind of, oh, golden snitch costume accessory, wonderful. Okay, so, and mostly books. But if I go up here again, and I do Legos, then I start seeing different stuff, right? Basically, Amazon is including my profile as well. And when I start seeing other things, right? So we actually have this one with the spiders, that's kind of fun. 
uh, I lifted, I didn't lift it at Target. I picked it up at Target. We were like, we are not buying anything on this trip. But then uh, we go in there, and it's, it's the book we just read and the scene in the movie we'd just seen with the big spider, and it's on sale. It's like on clearance for three bucks. I'm like, ah, shit, I gotta get it. Okay. Anyway, so over time, if you start looking at stuff, you start seeing, especially in the ads, you start seeing more related things. And anyway, over time, it all, it all kind of comes together. Amazon builds a profile of you, even during a single web visit. So if I go then look at something else completely unrelated, right? So I've looked at Harry Potter, looked at other stuff. And what is another thing I could look at? Just look at uh, what kids' toys, uh, what's something, that, uh, Spirograph. Okay, Spirograph, the old timey thing. We had those in the 70s. Okay, and let's see if it has a custom set of things for me. Related searches, no, All right, maybe not this one. Ah, here we go. Inspired by my browsing history. See, even though in this one visit I've looked at three products, Amazon just for that is customizing the recommendations for me. Kind of cool, huh? All right, the future is now. What a time to be alive. Okay. So, bunch of questions, right? So there's all kinds of implementation questions. We know fundamentally Amazon wants to give you recommendations. But just like Facebook has a lot of things to consider, there's a lot of wiggle room in designing policies for how they're going to show you the feed, Amazon has a lot of questions about what exactly they're going to show you in their recommender system. So, number one, historical window length, right? How far back in time are they going to look, right? Are they going to look like six months, six years, six days, what? Data decay rate. Clearly, more recent data is useful, but, yeah, how quickly, how much more useful, I guess, is the question. So these two are kind of a, an interesting balance there. And it's going to be different for different customers, different for different product categories. For example, uh, when you're in your 40s, your taste in music is pretty stable. When you're a teenager, it can change a lot. Uh, when you're in your 50s, your consumption of medical products is probably pretty constant. But damn, when you hit your 60s and 70s, that's when it all starts falling apart. and You're buying lots of different stuff all the time. Right, so different people, different stages of life, all this changes. Uh, likewise, how many vary, what kind of item variety do you want to include? Do you just want to include stuff from one category and give you the best recommendations there, just go with strictly with the recommendations? Or do you want to deliberately grab items from a mix of things? For example, if somebody's looking at Harry Potter books and Harry Potter Legos, do you consider, oh, I just want to show the best recommendations for all of those, which are mostly going to be in Legos and Harry Potter stuff, or do I also branch off into other kids' toys, other franchises, whatever? And purchase filtering. In some cases, there might be an item that you typically only buy once, right? So, for example, uh, it's unlikely that somebody who's bought one Harry Potter book is going to buy a second copy of that book. It's possible, but unlikely. And so if you can look at that person's uh, actual account and say, oh, we can do a quick scan on what they bought in the last few years, and we know they bought this thing, they're probably not going to be interested in a second one. We're not going to show that in the recommendations. Okay, so there's a lot of implementation questions that Amazon can uh, uniquely specify. All right. So business process reengineering, or BPR. BPR is basically the process of, Changing some process, typically done because new technology arrives, makes something possible that didn't used to be, right? So 1995, Amazon's operating, you know, basically a list-based recommender system. They implement their advanced recommender system, and boom, suddenly a lot of stuff is going to change, right? So again, typically due to new technology, sometimes due to something that new competitors do, and the business has to respond to that sometimes due to changing internal resources, right? Now you have the capability to do something that you previously didn't have. So some mix of competitive pressure and new capabilities are gonna lead to this. Now, most of the time, BPR is incremental, right? It's not a big change where you like rip out some old system by the roots and put in something completely new. Most of the time what happens is you think about, oh, we have this problem that's messed up a little bit, let's try to make it better. So. First thing you should do is map the process. So whatever the various steps are in the process, map that out. And in principle, that should already be, be done, right? Any, uh, you know, professional kind of business, if they have a process, there should be some map somewhere that explains all the stages of the process and how it's supposed to work. Then identify performance problem points, right? So something where it messes up. So what Amazon can do, for example, 1994, they look at their website and they recognize 
that a lot of people go to the site, enter a few search terms in the catalog, maybe click on a few things, give up without buying anything. And Amazon says, hey, we can do better than that, right? If 90% of our customers are coming to the site and not buying something because the catalog is so, you know, seems so scary, if we can capture one out of nine of those, we're basically going to double our sales, right? So we have 10% of our visitors buying stuff. If we can take a fraction of the 90% who aren't, kaboom, right? Bags and bags of money. So they brainstorm improvement techniques, right? Basically round up a bunch of guys, put them at a table and say, hmm, what can we do to fix this, right? Because this is 1995. This problem had not arisen before, right? The problem of how to keep customers coming to a website, there was not a lot of experience about this in 1995. So you have guys and they're just, oh, how are we gonna do this? And they come up with some ideas. At the end of the day, they try out their best ideas, right? Because again, there's no right or wrong answer in 1995. People don't know exactly what's gonna work. So they try out some stuff, implement it, Look and see how it did. If it did well, great. Try to make it better. If it didn't do well, drop it and try something else. Okay? And they keep on working on that. So that's the basic process for some kind of incremental BRP, BPR. Okay. But sometimes process reengineering isn't incremental. Sometimes it's actually revolutionary. So a lot of stuff changed with Amazon's recommender system, right? The user interface had to change because instead of their old site, you know, that had what it had. Instead, they have a recommender system, so now on every product page, boom, you get this set of recommendations, okay? It's gonna need more data. You're gonna be gathering more data from customers, right? It's not enough to just maybe look at purchases. You also wanna look at page views. You also maybe want a little bit more detailed information about customers who clicked on images to zoom them, or customers who scrolled down the whole page to read more, things like that. If you have a lot more data, managing the data is going to be trickier. You're going to need a big system to do it, and it's going to have to work fast enough so it doesn't slow down your page load times. And then it's going to have an impact on other systems, right? Presumably, if the recommender system is going well, Amazon's already growing fast, but if the recommender system works well, then your fast growth is going to go to explosive growth, and that's going to be hard to keep up with all of your business partnerships, right? With the publishers, with the shippers. Yeah, so you got to work on that. Really changes a lot of things. Okay, so I have some articles. If you're interested, a little bit of historical stuff. Uh, I'll mention one thing. So if, if you look at this, and I'm not saying you have to, I'm certainly not going to include this stuff on the exam, but fundamentally the way uh, recommender systems work is basically for any one thing, if they want to find out if two things are the same, basically... Represent data as a line. Okay, so this line is one thing. If you say this is one item, you could represent as a line all the customers that have bought it under all the different circumstances they bought it. And somehow you describe that with a line. Okay, and then for any other product, you come up with some line that intersects with it. And if it follows it pretty closely, Close fit means a good match, right? If the two lines basically line up together, it's a good match. On the other hand, if you have a line that looks more like, you know, this, you're gonna say, ah. Not closely lined up, not a good match. And again, I'm certainly not gonna ask you about this, but if you're interested in this sort of data analysis, this is fundamentally what's going on. They map one product as a line, the other candidate products as other lines, and the lines that are closest together, right? They basically have a metric for measuring the distance between them, you know, how much of a tilt there is. That's the closest match. Anyway. So yeah, if some of you are IDS majors and you go on to take some of these data mining courses, who knows, by then they may be teaching that. Okay, now, speed versus integration, right? Often getting something to the market is fast is a big priority. If it's a new system, right, Amazon in 1995, there's a lot of other online booksellers, they're all trying to be the next Amazon. Amazon's gotta get this thing out the door working pretty well, really fast. Now, it might sound counterintuitive, but it's often easier and faster to just build a separate database than try to be really careful and integrate it with everything you already have. Okay, 
So if you have your systems operating in a modular way, they're just, okay, we have this kind of standalone recommender system. I send data into it, it sends the results back, fine. It can exist kind of on its own. But long term, not having this integration creates some issues. Number one, if you have multiple copies of the data they, residing in different databases, due to human errors, due to update problems, due to system failures, in various ways, you can get data conflicts, and then you won't always get the right answer. You might ask one database something, get a wrong answer, versus the, another database has the right information. And it becomes very difficult to cross-check data for accuracy. Basically, you have to basically multiply the two tables in a database together to make sure that everything there, everything in one is in the other, and everything not in one is not in the other. It's actually a very big, very big uh, computational problem. And if databases are stored, all these copies are kept separately, there could be latency and queries across databases. Latency just means how long it takes to run. If a database operation has to consult multiple machines, yeah, sometimes that can slow things down too. Okay, so data silos are basically the manifestation of this. So if you have different functional areas, different work groups that are storing separate copies of the same data, that's a data silo. So, very common with paper-driven businesses, right? So, flashback to 1990, most businesses are working with paper instead of uh, digital documents. Yeah, that's what they did, right? You had your accounting department, they had all their papers. You had finance, they had theirs. Marketing, they had all theirs. And you actually, you know, like you go and you see something in Mad Men and there's like this giant room full of secretaries and another room full of big filing cabinets. It was all paper, right? Different, or different uh, functional areas kept different papers. Now, this is common the way businesses uh, grow. We'll talk about that in a second. But it can also happen because of uh, ownership uh, issues. For example, if there's a merger or an acquisition, there's typically a time where the two organizations operate more or less independently, right? They're owned by the same entity, and the owning entity may have a long-term plan of merging them all together. But in the year or two before all the details get finalized, yeah, they're still operating independently and they might have different uh, records with the same kind of data. And that's a problem. Also global operations, and we'll have an example of that in a minute. So with this kind of problem with data silos, the answers are there in the system. So at this point, we're assuming there aren't any errors yet. Answering the questions is possible, but getting them out is difficult. For example, if you have a query that has to contact multiple departments, you might need different database permissions. So instead of just having one system where you want to answer a question across departments, right, you might have to actually call up accounting and say, hey, I need you to find out this thing for me because nobody in your department has access to the accounting department's data. The other thing is database systems generally won't be optimized for any operations across databases, right? They're all designed so that the accounting people can get their data and the marketing people can get their data. They're not designed for marketing people to get what they need from the accounting data. Okay. I'm going to take, well, we'll talk about ERP in a minute, but here, here's a concrete example with uh, global operations. So global oil drilling operation has this big, big, big data repository about, you know, what kind of uh, minerals there are and what assay results there are. Assays like you test what stuff is in the ground so you can see, oh, is this likely to have oil or not? Okay. And what kind of drilling equipment they have available. But the problem is, it's global. So all of these records are written in the local language, right? This kind of, I, I forget if it was, it might have been Shell. I think it, I think it was Shell. Uh, but this was an actual case. So they acquired all sorts of drilling operations from all around the world, but they kept their original databases. And whatever language those databases were written in, the fields would reflect that. So different languages have different words for oil or different words for drilling machinery, different brands of machinery. Some are calibrated in gallons or barrels or liters, whatever. Uh, so all that stuff is different. Now, the outcome, how that works, if you have a local problem, right? Like uh, say you have a Norwegian offshore drilling operation, you can answer a question that's, where its scope is limited to that drilling operation, right? You want to ask, oh, this one spot off the coast of Norway, what kind of oil do they have there? Yeah, they can answer that question, right? Because that's just within that one. But if you want to do a global question, like say, okay, what do we have in Brazil and Venezuela and, you know, the U.S. and sure, Norway too, and maybe they got something in the Middle East they're drilling, right? All that together 
it's really tough to do a comparison, right? If you want to say, what are our 10 best drilling opportunities worldwide? Well, all of your different little databases, they're all essentially speaking a different language. They're different uh, encoding structures. Some may not even have all the fields that the other ones do. It's very difficult to get, you know, to translate from all of those databases to each other, okay? So, system can answer local problems that are within a silo, but a global problem, like, hey, what are our 10 best drilling options for the next year? That's going to be a huge nightmare to try to resolve. Okay? Yes? You have to translate all of those different databases to some common language. Okay? And that's essentially integration. Yeah. So that's what you do, right? If you want to answer that, if now the question is, if your system only has local questions, then you don't have to worry about that, right? Then it's not a problem. But if you find that you're asking a lot of these global problems very often, then you're going to realize that there is a problem with your system that you need to fix because it's no longer good for that. Okay. So, question you might ask, right? Well, this sounds stupid. You say, why wouldn't you just integrate everything from the start? Well, for one, for small businesses, silos are basically only a theoretical problem. If you're talking about some small operation that's all basically in one room or one floor, right? Operation only exists in one location. You might have one employee that actually manages separate silos, right? If it's a small company, you might have one person that manages all the marketing data, all the finance data, all the accounting data, and that's just the person you go to. And the volume of data you're dealing with is pretty small anyway. So even if stuff is, you know, potentially in like different formats, there you don't have enough records where it's that big of an issue. You just kind of eyeball it and say, oh yeah, I see this thing was wrong. Let's fix that now. Okay. It's kind of like the same way if uh, Professor Fife and I, we have our two, you know, different formats for our lecture stuff. Yeah. And there's some difficulties in translation, but there's just two of us and it's pretty easy to resolve them. But if your organization expands to include thousands of people, if there are like thousands of IDS professors all over the world, all trying to teach different flavors of IDS 200 and somehow translate them to a common standard, yeah, forget about it, okay? So the problems only happen when you grow. Data silos are pretty much perfectly fine. I mean, you can see, again, they have theoretical problems. You have different copies of the data that might conflict. But when they have, they're not that common, they're easy to resolve if your operation is small. But when you're big, those problems happen all the time. Okay, so when you have to have this integration, when you recognize, wow, there is a problem, businesses are basically gonna integrate your data into some common system. So identical tables, fields, and formats. Uh, we'll eventually talk about ERP. ERP is basically the kind of system that does this. So let me take a moment though. All right, so we understand what I'm talking about. If uh, So, English language, U.S., right, might have uh, different rankings for oil quality, might have, uh, you know, mineral one, mineral two, whatever, might have different formats, uh, volume, whatever, okay? And I have another one, let's say, I don't know, let's say it's in U.K. English, that's... You know, you'd think it would be easy, but maybe it isn't, right? So they have oil quality, but instead of uh, here, right, the oil quality in the U.S. is measured in uh, 1 to 99, right? We have a numeric system for measuring the quality. Maybe in the U.K., they have a system where it's A to G, right, where A is great and G is terrible, and there's not a clear mapping between numbers, okay? Likewise, they might have a different set of minerals, mineral 1, mineral 2, mineral three, maybe we're looking at three, and their volume, right, they're on the metric system, and we're not, so their volume, you know, is in metric units. So again, just some kind of simple thing like that, it's not an apples to apples comparison, it's apples to oranges, and you have to come up with some kind of translation between the two databases. So developing an ERP system basically means you take all these different data formats and integrate them into one common structure. Okay, so again, you have one database where you can ask the question and you'll get the same answer in the same format. And of course, that also means that subsequent data entry has to adhere to that 
you know, universal format. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about data mining. So all these recommendations, they're obtained from what's called data mining. So fundamentally, data mining is just looking for patterns in your data. So for example, you might look for positive, negative correlations. Positive correlations, things that happen together. Negative correlations, things that don't happen together. And you also look at trends over time, right? So these things used to happen together, but they don't, right? Or these things didn't used to happen together, but now they do. Data mining is used for all sorts of uh, different fields. Now, the patterns are in there, right? Anybody can look at the data and identify these patterns. The real uh, art to it is deciding, number one, which patterns are important, and number two, trying to make some use of them. So have you guys heard about the, uh, the beer and diaper thing? Anybody heard about beer and diapers? No. No, okay. So beer and diapers is something of a legend in uh, marketing and uh, uh, IT circles, you know, data mining circles. Uh, a lot of people get the story wrong. So the, the story, right, which makes an entertaining story, is that businesses found that beer and diapers were often bought together. And the reason why they were bought together, the story about it, is that, well, it's Thursday night and it's 10 o'clock at night and the wife says to the husband, hey, we need some diapers. And he says, but it's 10 o'clock. And she says, but we need diapers. And he's like, fine. So he gets in the car, goes to the store. As he's at the store getting diapers, he sees some beer and he's like, fuck it, it's 10 o'clock and I'm out here buying diapers, I'm getting some beer too. And he walks out and gets some beer. And the idea is beer and diapers were often bought, surprisingly often bought together, right? Because you wouldn't think of that's something that people do. Well, the actual story is much less interesting. So you guys know Osco, Osco that used to always be paired with the jewels and still sometimes is? Yeah, Osco, they had this massive uh, range of SKUs, right? SKUs, uh, inventory codes for particular items. So they had this massive list of items that they were carrying in inventory. And they said, we have too many uh, we can pare some of these down, right? We basically, we still want to supply most of the things that most of our customers want, but we're going to remove the least important ones, okay? The ones that aren't really selling well, that sort of thing. And they did a whole big analysis, and they did find, you know, that there was a correlation for beer and diapers, but it wasn't the point, it wasn't a major focus, it was just something that they observed, huh, that's something interesting, and we happen to notice it, Okay. So, but what they were doing data mining for was just basically to comb through and figure out which items they could prune from their inventory without, you know, overly negatively affecting sales. Another story, right? So stuff can go wrong, but the good one is this, right? So you may have heard of this, you may not. Several years ago, Target, uh, the story, how Target knew a high school girl was pregnant before her parents. So one of the things you may uh, recognize is that when you're about to get pregnant or when you, well, when you are pregnant, there are certain products that you're more likely to buy, okay? And this girl was uh, showing up in Target's data mining. She was buying those kind of products and Target said, oh, well, you're probably pregnant. So what they did is without looking at who the girl was or even what her age was, they bundled up a little, you know, coupon uh, bundle and said, hey, congratulations, we think you're expecting here's some stuff you might be interested in. And her dad, I forget the age of the girl, but you know, this was, this was not a yay, we're pregnant situation. This was a oh shit kind of a situation. So the dad gets on the phone with Target, says, how dare you? My sweet little girl would never do that thing that you think she did. And well, maybe she will later, but not yet. Anyway, and Target, of course, apologized. Oh, we're, you know, very sorry. And then you know what happens, right? Because you can see it there. Like a month later, it turns out, you know, the girl has the baby or she's visibly pregnant or whatever. And yeah. But at that point, Target says, yeah, you know, maybe we're going to stop doing these uh, coupon bundles in the mail until we're pretty sure that somebody's happy about it. Okay. Yeah. Yes. No, there's other ways. I mean, the card is the easiest way. Right, but if somebody's always coming in and buying in cash, then no, they're probably not going to get that. Yeah. Yeah, you could do that, right? So if they if they have partial information, they can do that. Uh, sometimes, yeah. I mean, with with this level of specificity, yeah, it probably works best. Yeah, details, right? It probably works best if you have the credit card. But other kinds of data mine, they can just look at big picture trends like uh, the, the Osco thing, 
they, it doesn't matter who's buying the stuff. They can just look at, oh, these are things that are bought together in transactions. Yeah. Anyway, okay. So we'll cover a few of these, and then we'll call it a day. Maybe we'll cover like two. So number one, data mining is a very big field, right? Combined statistics, algorithm design, computer programming. And if you're interested in data mining, you can make a career of it doing, you know, any one or more of those things. There's, a, there's room for you in there. It's a big thing now. Most business programs offer courses in data mining, right? UIC included. Uh, last, I, I mean, we have a couple uh, different kinds of things, you know, varying degrees of advancedness. Uh, I know Sid uh, Bhattacharya, he teaches, uh, our department head, he teaches one. I, had, I didn't take it. It came around after me. I took it with Stan Sclove. Um, anyway, so we have courses, and they're pretty good, but, you know, 16 weeks, you're only going to get the tip of the iceberg, right? Data mining is a very big field. Uh, you're going to learn to do some simple correlation stuff. Who knows? Maybe you'll do that kind of uh, correlation with the lines like I was talking about. I don't know. But anyway, in this course, we're just going to talk about a few major techniques. You won't actually have to do them. There's no math, right? I won't make you do math on the exams, but I'll talk about how the models work. So, first one, regression analysis. And maybe we'll just do this one, and then we'll call it a day. So, Suppose you have a problem, you have an auto manufacturer that wants to produce some profit maximizing number of cars. Well, how do they know what the profit maximizing number of cars is going to be? Well, the first thing they got to figure out is how many they think they're going to sell. Okay, so they come up with some kind of complicated model around that. And suppose they uh, resolve it into four main factors. They find that there's four factors that pretty much explain how many cars you're going to sell uh, besides price. So first one, gas prices, right? All else equal, if gas prices go up, car sales are probably going to go down, right? It's going to push people into public transit, going to push people into staying home. The other thing, depending on the mix of cars the automaker is doing, if gas prices go up, there's going to be a shift from uh, big cars to small cars, right? I mean, you guys saw when we had that big uh, uh, spike in oil prices. Eh, maybe you didn't. I guess it was like 15, almost 15 years ago. Big spike in uh, oil prices, and uh, you know you had all these people that were trying to unload their Hummers and other big vehicles, and they were buying compacts instead. It was like five, six bucks a gallon for a little bit. Anyway, another thing, domestic GDP growth, right? So basically, if the economy is doing well, people are more likely to buy cars, right? They're going to have money. They say, yay, I have a good job. I have lots of money. I'm going to get a new car. Likewise, consumer confidence, right, tends to be correlated with GDP growth, but suppose they've looked at the number and found that these two are not only both important, but also separately important. And last, interest rates, right? So we know if interest rates are high, then people are going to have to pay a lot extra to finance their car purchases, so they're going to be less likely to hold, you know, less likely to actually go ahead and buy it. If interest rates are low, then people don't mind, you know, being on the hook for uh, bills down the road. So those are the four factors they come up with. Now, the way regression analysis works is fundamentally this equation here. So, you have a few things. Number one, whoop. all right, we're going to do this here. See that there? Okay, that's the equation we're looking at. Okay. So over here, why? Why is the result? Why is our expected sales? This over here, these are a bunch of uh, factor pairs we'll talk about in a second. But suppose for a minute that all those BX pairs, they're zeroed out. And so they all come out to zero. Then the only thing left is Y equals alpha. That's, a, you know, that's an alpha, not an A. So alpha is the baseline for when all of those other factors are zero. Okay? And we, uh, we assume that. The other, the Bs are the Xs. So the Bs... Those are multipliers. They're called betas, and they're multipliers of each factor. So each of these x's is the particular value of one of those four variables we looked at. So gas prices, GDP growth, consumer confidence, interest rates, all those are uh, assigned an x value. And then our modeling process basically figures out what alpha is and figures out what those uh, betas are and comes up with a line. Okay, and the line is going to be something like, you know, Something like this. Okay. Y equals alpha plus, you know, B0, X0, dot, dot, dot. Right? 
It's going to express it as a line. Yes. You should understand what the model is. Yeah. Okay. So. so what you have in this model, you have a set of independent variables. So each of these factors that we talked about, those are independent variables. Those are the X's. And each of those variables has a relative weight. Those are the betas, right? So those are those Bs. So for every variable, we find out our expectation for the future, and we multiply it by the beta that our model gave us. So we run all this data through some uh, regression modeling software, and it gives us back basically the betas and the alpha, okay? And then when we want to find out the prediction, we just plug in all those numbers. So our model gives us the alpha, gives us all the betas. We have these values for whatever our predictive analytics says these states are going to be in the future, or maybe what they are right now, and we come up with an estimate of car sales. So in this case, right, if our model gave us an alpha of 500,000, gas prices had a value of three and a beta of 30,000, that's 30,000 times three is 90,000. Domestic GDP, beta of 15,000 times three, or three times, yeah, 15,000 times three, 45,000. Consumer confidence, 50 times 5,000. And interest rates, negative 25,000 times five. So we have 500 plus 90 plus 45, 635, uh, plus 250, so 885 minus 125,000, 760,000. So our estimate for the future for Y, based on this data, be 760,000. Basically, with regression analysis, what we're doing, we analyze the data, we come up with a line that expresses the relationship between all those deep independent variables, resulting in some value for our independent variable, the thing we're looking for, total auto sales here. Okay, that's regression analysis. We'll come back on Monday and we'll close up uh, data mining and start on the next, next lecture.